Hi everyone. Today I want to talk about serverless commerce and how it makes us higher, stronger and faster. So who am I? I'm Christoph. I work for a company called Commerce Tools. As you probably know, we build a cloud native commerce system. And I spend a lot of time um, integrating our um, platform into the serverless ecosystems of different cloud providers, like the big ones like AWS, Google Cloud and Azure. But a couple of years ago, I spent a little bit of time uh, with Iron.io. They were kind of the first guys who really started using the term serverless, uh, but today they're not really relevant anymore. And you know, I've, I've seen a lot of different cloud systems, and that's why I became interested in interoperability between different um, cloud standards. So I joined the serverless work group of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Uh, that foundation is part of the Linux Foundation, and it hosts, for example, Kubernetes. Um, but it also has this serverless work group, and we create a standard or a specification called Cloud Events, and it tries to uh, have events in the cloud so that they can travel through different um, providers of third-party APIs, like what Commerce Tools builds, but then is also accepted into message queues. Well, that's not really the topic of today. Um, today, I want to talk about serverless in commerce. And then, you know, serverless is a name. Naming is hard, and it's maybe not the best name. So maybe serviceful is a better name that has been proposed. Uh, but unfortunately, like, refactoring is even harder, so uh, we probably have to stick with the name serverless. And, you know, a criticism that a lot of people do on that name is, but there are still servers behind serverless. You still need them. So how can you call it serverless? And that's kind of technically a fair criticism. Um, but if you look at, uh, from an emotional standpoint, what it feels like to use serverless, that's actually true. And I compare it a little bit to if you order food. Like, you don't know, you don't have to chop the ingredients, you don't have to buy, you don't have to clean the kitchen afterwards, right? So someone had to cook that food, someone had to care about all the things, but it was not you. Perfect. And serverless is kind of the same thing. Someone still has to manage the infrastructure, update dependencies, make sure the network is set up, blah, blah, blah. But it's not you. You're freed from that. You can do something else. So let's maybe look at a bit more uh, proper uh, description of what serverless is. So the Cloud Native Computing Foundation says such a platform provides one or both of the following. The first, I guess, everyone has heard of before. Um, if you've been to other serverless talks, they mostly talk about function as a service, and that is the first foundation, basically. So just a quick reminder, uh, function as a service is event-driven computing. You deploy like small units of code called functions. They're triggered by events or HTTP requests. And the most important part is that it scales without you having to manage the underlying infrastructure. So examples are Lambda or Azure Functions. So these are like prop proprietary implementations, but there's also open source ones like o Apache OpenWhisk and Knative. So you can run them yourself, but for example, OpenWhisk is also employed uh, by Adobe and IBM and Knative you can run on Google Cloud, so you don't necessarily have to run the open source implementations yourself. And the second part is the backend as a service. And not a lot of people who talk about serverless today necessarily also include a backend as a service in this. But it's, I think, a crucial point. So backend as a service then is defined as a third-party API-based service that replaces a core subset of functionality in an application. And the important point is that those APIs auto-scale and operate transparently. Again, you don't have to manage the underlying infrastructure. So examples of that are, for example, S3, Aurora, MySQL, or Firebase, which are more like general computing uh, platforms. So you don't, they're not, for example, you can use them in gaming, in finance, in commerce, they don't really care. And then the second list of examples, these are where they are really focused on one problem domain. For example, Twilio is really into SMS and voice calls, so all this um, communication stuff. Braintree is payment, and Commerce Tools is a commerce platform, obviously. And the important part is that they auto-scale. So I have here the Aurora MySQL. So that's a new serverless database from Amazon. So you may think, OK, Amazon had hosted MySQL since ages. What is new about this? Well, what is new about this is that it scales. So before, you had to go and say, OK, I want this hosted um, MySQL. And then I want four servers. And each server should have four CPUs with that and that, and then so much RAM, blah, blah. So you yourself had to do all the capacity planning. 
with the Aurora MySQL, you basically just say, I need this database, and then it does the scaling for you. And I think that is really important to understand if we look at the overall serverless ecosystem. It doesn't make a lot of sense if your function as a service scales and you don't have to care about that, but about the other parts, you still have to do all the planning ahead. So if you want to uh, transition fully to serverless, we have to make sure that every piece we use is also serverless. Another important point is that serverless systems are pay for what you use and you don't pay for when they're idle. So for example, on Lambda, um, you're charged per code execution. If your code doesn't run, you're not charged. On S3, you're charged for data storage. So even if it doesn't technically is being used, it is still being stored, so you pay for it. But then you also pay for uh, data transfer. On Twilio, you're charged per call or SMS. On Braintree, per payment. So for us in commerce, it basically means the more money you make, the more money your providers makes. Why? Be um, because, for example, on Braintree, you're charged per payment, so the more orders you make, the more money Braintree makes. On Twilio, the same thing, like if you send calls uh, or if you send SMS for each order, the more orders you make, the more SMS you send, the more um, money Twilio makes. So the incentives of your provider and you are basically aligned. That's different in, in more uh, classical hosting, where it's just uh, charged on a server basis, and if the server is just idle, you're still paying for it. So to summarize, that makes us uh, jump higher because we just have less baggage. We don't have to worry about scaling, planning capacity, managing servers or virtual machines. So what makes us stronger? So we started out from monolithic systems. So these existing commerce systems try to do many things at once. Um, so you get one vendor, you get everything in integrated. Um, but these often are hard to scale independently, and they're usually focused on one programming language. So you may, if they're written in PHP, then you're stuck with that. If they're written in Java, you basically have to do that. So we transition to microservices, and now the vendor tries to build like a smaller subset of functionality. It tries to do one thing really well, and then it tries to be compatible with other services. So instead of buying from one vendor, you pick like the different vendors that have the best thing for you. So we, as a headless commerce platform, we see that we're being combined with different CMS vendors and that customers have different requirements for the CMS so they can pick the one that uh, fits their needs best. Another point is that we have an event-driven architecture, so it means we can more loosely couple our services and they're also therefore better scalable. And last but not least, we have a free choice of technology. So whatever you like, whether it's something new or semi-new like Node.js or Go, or you still love doing PHP, you can use whatever works best for you. So that makes us stronger. So we have an event-driven architecture. We can build smaller independent services, and we can pick the best um, third-party services that fit best to our needs. And they're API-based and headless, so we can combine them really well. You know, may say, okay, stop, Christoph. You're talking about stuff like that I've heard before. Like, this is all regular cloud. I heard this for instance 10, 15 years and microservice. Yeah, yeah. People are talking about it since 10 years. So where's the serverless part, right? Okay. Here comes the serverless part. We have one problem, um, with the move to cloud and microservices. And that is extensibility and customizing. So if you look back into these old monolithic systems, there's one thing that it kind of well. If you wanted to change a small set of functionality, let's say you only want to write 10 lines of code, or maybe it's just a day worth of work, then doing that was really easy. You just find the place where you need to hook in, and then you change that code directly, or maybe you into implement an interface, and then um, you overwrite that and hook your class in. And maybe you should write a test, but then everything else kind of works. You just deploy it whenever you do it with your next deployment. So you don't need to worry about setting up an extra service. Um, you don't need to worry about security because it already runs in the right context and so on. But if you want to write a microservice, a traditional microservice that's just 10 lines of code, there's a lot of overhead involved in setting that up, getting client credentials for it, and so on. And so you may ask yourself, so why do these API providers not just let me allow to run my custom code right under Node why can I not modify their code? And to answer that question, we have to look a bit behind the scenes of a multi-tenant platform. So we want to offer scalability, right? 
So we want to um, scale from free, like you don't do any request, you don't pay for it, to basically production level, um, super high throughput system. <clears throat> so this is actually a use case we see a lot when there are um, staging or development systems. So maybe on the weekend, no one works, everyone enjoys their free time as they should, and then they come back into the office on Monday morning, write a little bit of code, run the test, and then of course the test runs in the cloud, and then it just goes from zero, and then they paralyze the test because they want to have them finished quickly, right? So from the perspective of our platform, there's like a product that has no traffic, and then suddenly a big spike, they run the test, and then it goes back to zero. So how can we handle that? We handle that with a multi-tenant architecture. So we have a lot of tenants and we put them onto the same system and they share a lot of resources at the same time. So that allows us to scale down to zero, um, charge those that go down to zero nothing because these resources, they're still used by other tenants. So if I have this big building and they're like, one, one person moves out, it's not a big problem for me because I still have 99 others that are still paying money, basically. And then if I want to scale up instantly, so let's say one tenant suddenly goes from nothing to a thousand requests per second. How do I handle that? Well, this traffic increase by a single tenant is basically a drop in the bucket of all tenants that I have on my platform. So if I have a, a thousand other tenants and they do 100 requests per second on average, so I have like overall traffic of 100,000 requests per second, then these 1,000 more requests per second, they don't really matter. It's like it's a 1% increase, probably my auto scaling doesn't even notice that something has changed, right? So that's the good part about the multi-tenant architecture. And this also is what allows me to be very cheap and, uh, when you don't use it and scale up really highly. But it comes with the price that I need to have a predictable worst case behavior per request. Um, the, so if I have a single tenant system, and I allow a tenant to modify his code, and then suddenly he consumes a lot of memory per request, and then he gets an out-of-memory uh, error, and then he kills his own system. That's his problem. Like, that was stupid, you shouldn't do that. But it affects him. It's not my problem. But in a multi-tenant system, when a, t a tenant would uh, suddenly start consuming a lot of memory, he would consume more shared resources, and then it suddenly starts affecting everyone else on the system. And that is a problem for me as a provider because I guaranteed everyone that they should get like, their uh, good traffic. And you know, I, then I have downtime for other tenants that were not at fault for this. So I need to stop that. And then the way that these products stop that is they clearly define what the limits are. So these limits are typically very high and they're very upfront about these limits, so you don't unexpectedly run into them. And usually people just don't because they are high, but they are there. <clears throat> so for example, on SQS, the maximum message size is 256 kilobyte, which is okay, it's not a lot, but it's not too little, so if you know that, you can work with it. Um, but they won't allow you to send like a, gig a gigabyte of message through SQS, because then that would blow up their uh, worst case behavior per request. So how do we extend such a multi-tenant system then? We cannot run custom code on those shared API nodes, that's dangerous, right? One good part is we already have this event-driven architecture, so we don't have to run a lot of the stuff that we can do asynchronously, we don't have to run on this node, we just pushed in somewhere else, the systems are decoupled, perfect, no problem. The problem is that not everything can be done asynchronously. For example, if you have a checkout and <clears throat> under some circumstances you don't want to um, let the checkout go through and create an order, so maybe you want to check addresses or do a fraud protection and so on, you don't want to go, okay, I accepted this, send out an event, and that event tells, oh, I'm not accepting this order, and then you go back and, I don't know, display the user a second later, oh, by the way, we changed our mind, I do not accept your order. That's not good. So you want to do this synchronously. And from a platform provider, this can be um, a bit um, yeah, dangerous as well, because you don't know how long you have to wait for the other guys to come back. So you want these synchronous calls to be reliable and predictable. So the um, function as a service then brings a couple of advantages for us over web webhooks. So for the um, consumer of our API service, they are quick to stand up compared to a traditional microservice 
Also, the um, provider can take care of security. They can already install necessary libraries, and it can be integrated into their web interface or CLI. I'll have a cool demo of Twilio of that in a minute. And then also, it gives the provider more control over the network latency and scalability of the underlying system. So, function as a services combined with these third party APIs, they may uh, allow us to run faster and care more about um, our underlying business objectives because the functions are really quick to set up. The function as a service gives the uh, platform provider scalability guarantees. So he's maybe more comfortable with opening up his API. And there's no need to manage underlying infrastructure anymore, neither for the third party APIs nor for the code that I run as a service for myself. <clears throat> All right, so now we come to maybe the more interesting part of the talk, which is the demo time. So the first uh, product that I want to show is Twilio. So Twilio, what I really like about them is how easy the setup is. And the, the thing with this live demo is I did it before, and I realized it's pretty boring on its own because you don't really, the interesting part is what I will not show in this live demo. So let's first look at the tutorial for what was before serverless. So Twilio is a longer existing company. They've been around for a couple of years. And they're, um, yeah, so their standard way was to um, make you set up your own server. So we, we uh, can look here a bit what is in this tutorial. So blah, blah. First, we have to install some dependencies. Um, then we have to create a file. Then we start a server. And, you know, that's OK so far. But then we're kind of stuck because now I have the server started, but it runs on my local laptop. So the Twilio API cannot talk to it. So what do you do then? Blah, blah, blah. Well, set up ngrok. I don't know who, who's heard of this before. It's basically, OK, a couple. So it's basically, it allows you your um, local laptop um, connects to Ngrok, and Ngrok makes a public HTTP URL so that your um, laptop is basically visible on the internet on the one port. And, they, and they're pretty smart about passing firewalls and so on. Okay, so you first have to install Ngrok, you may have to configure it, blah, blah. Then um, you have to forward this particular port, get the URL, blah, blah, put this in here. Okay, and then you're finally done. Like there was a lot of more work to do after um, you start your server. And the next problem is this is your local um, setup. This is not a scalable production environment, right? So if you want to use the same code for real, then you have to deploy it um, somewhere else. So let's see how it works actually with functions. So here you can just set up a new function. I already created one, but it's basically the same thing. So here I want to create a small menu where you can go and um, ask something. So here, in this menu, you're asked, hey, if you're serverless, press 1, otherwise press 2. And if you press 1, we'll enter your hello called code talks commerce. Ah. All right, let's save that. Your function is now deploying. And it has been deployed. That's it. Basically, then I have to enter the um, phone number uh, in the phone number. Or rather, I have to add the function into the phone number. So I already set this up. But just to show you, so here, this is just integrated. If I have a webhook, then I have to know my own URL. All right, so let's try to call this. Uh -huh. so let me go back to the code so you can see it. So. To a full account. All right. So this is the trial account message, so let's go. If you are serverless, press 1. Otherwise, press 2. All right, let's press 1. Hello, Code Talks Commerce. Okay, so that works. So this was all I had to do. Like, compared to what we had to do before with standing up all these things, that was really easy. And the cool part is, this is like production-grade setup. Like, I did, this was already checked for me. Basically, it means I'm safe. Twilio makes sure that no one can access this function. I also didn't have to set up any dependencies, so I have the Twilio library already in my function. So that's cool. 
The next one I want to talk about is Braintree. So that's a payment uh, service provider. Um, they were bought by PayPal. They're also around since a couple of years, and uh, three or four months ago, they introduced also their functions. And what I really like about them is to which extent they let you extend their API. So <clears throat> they offer payment methods. They have about 10 of them. Um, but they say like there are always like some regional ones they don't want to support. For example, if there are, you can buy things by credit, like you don't pay for a TV right now, but you pay over it for 12 months. So you'll make a contract with a bank and that's more, usually more regional thing. So it's not necessarily interesting for Braintree um, to offer that in each country. But if you want to use like one payment service provider and you want to have your other microservices all using the same API and you don't want to use an extra API gateway and manage all these things, then it would be cool if like the Braintree API would be your one place to go for all your payment needs. And so what they do is they allow you to add your own payment methods into their API. So here's a bit of code you write, you have to write. So here, this is the authorization thing. So you get a context object and the context is specific to Braintree. So within this context, you would find, for example, the currency, the order amount, and a lot of other things I won't show. But it basically gives you all the info, um, whatever Braintree has on this payment. And then you can go and, for example, call your other service with this information. Then this other service can go back and say, yeah, this is cool, this is not cool, whatever. And then you go back and tell Braintree, yep, this is authorized, or no, I don't want this, or whatever. And then Braintree will integrate this into the overall uh, payment method flow. So, and then you write a YAML file and there you declare, hey, this is a payment method. And I know you need these five functions. Here, you can find them in these files. So if you look at it, um, it kind of looks similar to a interface, what I'm implementing here. If I'm in a traditional, I don't know, Java system, I would have an interface and I'd say, okay, if you want to implement this interface, I'm calling you, I need you to implement these five methods. Please give me a class with that interface. So this isn't the same thing, but conceptually it is very similar in that um, to, uh, Braintree defines what they need from me. I tell them which code to run for each of these and then we're good and we can plug together. And that gets us very close to the extensibility that I have in or the way that I extend systems within a single process and a single programming language environment. Okay, the last part, not so surprising maybe, is um, commerce tools. And I think what I'm really proud of is our multi-cloud integration. So we integrated, as I said before, with um, Amazon, Google Cloud, and Azure. So, um, so this is... Postman, I won't bore you too much with the details of our API. Um, well, here, this is our subscriptions endpoint, and here you can plug other things into um, our API to talk with them. So, for example, here I integrated with Google Cloud PubSub, um, and here I implemented SNS from AWS, and here I got Azure Service Bus. So these are like free tech, uh, message queues that are usually used. Um, when you want to connect to a function as a service. You know, and then they will send me, whenever there's something about orders, they will forward me these events. <clears throat> All right, so let's look maybe at the Lambda function first. So I, it's a bit cheesy code, but it tries to detect fraud orders. And what it does is it says, okay, if you're sending to a PO box, that is fishy. I better manually review it. Right, so then I would just set the status and it's, I'm just printing out on the console. Otherwise, I would just say, okay, pass. <clears throat> so then I have exactly the same code here on, can you read this? Yeah. Um, on Google Cloud. So this code here is basically the same code. The only difference is that I have a different adapter. So what we've done is we wrote a couple of small adapters that take um, the same event, but from a different message queue and pass them into our own format. So here, for example, this is how we extract our uh, event out of a Google Cloud pops up message. And that looks a bit different for a Lambda function uh, that gets an SNS message. All well, these are details, um, not so interesting. So let's try this. I will create a card 
and I will try to send it to Kultur Brauerei. Let's see if that works. So here's my card. Then I order it. And now I hopefully should see this popping up in my locks. Bop, bop, bop. Okay, it is started. Well, then let's see how far we are here. Okay, so Google Cloud already tells me this is, has passed. Let's try the same thing here. And on Lambda, it has also passed. So both uh, function as a services have run and got the message. Let's try again. And now I'm trying to send it to a PO box. Let's create the card and create the order. And then we'll see how quick their logging is. Okay, let's check here. No, not there yet. So the logging is obviously also an asynchronous process, so it takes a few seconds. Okay, so this one was in is in manual review on AWS, and here we are. Okay, so the cool thing I think about this is that you can yourself decide which uh, function as a service to use. And we try to integrate really well with um, those systems. So we use exactly the authorization and security uh, method that comes with each cloud. And what one of our uh, customers did is they created a Terraform plugin for commerce tools. So it's really cool. Like you can set up, um, for example, your SNS queue and then your function as a service in the very same file that you um, declare your subscription and other things for commerce tools. So it looks like uh, you have this one file where you declare everything, where you have your whole infrastructure. All right. So to summarize, serverless um, allows us to jump higher because we have less baggage and we just don't have to worry about like things like scaling or managing virtual machines. We have an event-driven architecture with smaller independent services and we can pick the best third-party API services and combine them together more easily because they're API-based and headless. So that makes us stronger. And what makes us go faster are three things. The first thing I showed in the Twilio demo is that functions are much quicker to set up and it can be really well integrated into the backend as a service offering. The function as a service gives the um, provider more guarantees in terms of scalability. So we've seen that Braintree allows you to hook really deeply into um, their core functionality as a provider. And finally, there is uh, no need for you to manage the underlying infrastructure anymore. So before you may have some third-party APIs that you didn't have to worry about scaling, or you always had to worry about your custom code. So now everything can run as a service. And you're really free to care about uh, what what you really have to achieve and not so much about the operational aspect of your commerce system. That's it, thank you. So we're also hiring, so if you're one of the guys who thinks it's fun to work on this infrastructure and make all the hard problems, that it's easier for the other guys, so we're hiring. Thanks you. Now it's question time. <laughs> Any questions? So one question from my side, um, how do you do versioning of that uh, function actually? I mean, coming from a not so serverless approach, uh, saying I have my Git repository somewhere or whatever I use, um, how would I actually do versioning in a really distributed function as a server, uh, serverless uh, world? So that depends. So if you, uh, I mean, I showed a lot of stuff where you write it in, uh, in here. So this depends on your system, but for example, AWS will, whenever you save it, um, they actually have versions of it. So you can always basically do a rollback and say, I want to go to the previous version. Let me see, here's publish new version. You can also create an alias where you, you have latest, but if you have different versions, you can create an alias and then you can roll back. So, oops. So this is one way to do it. You do it really in the function as a service. The other way is you probably shouldn't store your code here. Like if you have more involved in your functions, you have set this all up in your uh, development pipeline. You have this in Git 
and then you can deploy it with a more regular deployment process. So then okay. you can uh, basically do it from a Git repo. And this is the same for Commerce Tutor as well, so that I can push my integration, my code, like you mentioned with the Terraform plugin? So you don't really push the code to us, you push the code to Lambda, Google Cloud, wherever you want to. That's true. And, yeah. But, but the, um, the integration that you mentioned, like uh, pointing to or send my order, so what that was to, especially that function in the Google Cloud, for example. Yeah, so if you have it in a Terraform file, you can like, then you have infrastructure as code, and then you version that code so you can roll back your infrastructure as well. Exactly. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Ah, yeah. Hi, I'm interested in the cost aspect of all of this. I'm not sure if you've been using this serverless architecture or service-based architecture for all the time. Maybe you've used uh, a premise-based solution before instead. And you know, for, for on-premise solutions, it's relatively easy to calculate costs of your total system. And having every part of your stack scale automatically is going to introduce many different small cost points that also scale with your revenue. So I, I would like to know under the line, is it going to be more profitable to use these kinds of services with automatic cost scaling, or is it going to be a little bit more expensive but provide maybe a better experience for the developers and for deploying new stuff? Yeah, I think we can split this question into two parts. Like one is what do I pay for my infrastructure itself? And the second part is how much do I spend for personal costs to keep the infrastructure running? So the hope is that you overall cost for keeping the infrastructure running, you will save a lot of money basically there. Or you have this, I think we're all, all companies are more of the problems to hire good developer and ops persons. So usually we don't save money, but we deploy the same persons on some projects that bring more value than managing the infrastructure. So that's, that's the first part of the answer. The second part is the actual infrastructure cost. And I think it depends. So if you have, if you're really good at keeping your, all your servers busy and at high load, then serverless will be more expensive. But the thing is that most people don't. So, um, yeah, everyone in e-commerce has like patterns where during the night they do a lot less work than they do during the day and so on. Um, so if you're not utilizing your services very well, then it is likely that you'll save money there. So it, it really depends, um, especially if you have like smaller, um, use cases. So, I mean, you can Google it. You can find uh, examples of people who say, ah, oh, for my use case, it's totally expensive, but then they're usually really compute heavy platforms. When you see other guys who basically had to, they needed redundancy. So they had two VMs running all the time. And this cost, I don't know, $200 a month. And then they have only the serverless functions that run when, they, when they're needed. And so they save a bunch of money. And, and they do this, I mean, need $200 for each sort of subservice they have. Um, and so then they save a lot of money. So it depends on how good you utilize your resources right now. But overall, I think in commerce that um, people will on, over, on average save money with it, even on the hardware part sort of. All right. Thank you. Thanks.